over the past decade, weather records worldwide have been broken and then quickly broken again. Torrential floodwaters wash away roads, devastate homes and businesses, and scenes like this are being repeated all over the world. As CO2 levels in the Earth's atmosphere rise, more of the heat that would normally escape back into space is being trapped, just as the layer of glass in a greenhouse holds in more of the sun's warmth. Average temperatures are rising and the planet's weather patterns are changing. While some parts of the world are experiencing unprecedented droughts, others are having more frequent, more extreme floods. The Danube, Europe's main waterway, has exceeded record levels, and in low-lying areas of Bangladesh, flooding is becoming more extreme. In Germany recently, the Elbe River threatened to swamp the historic centre of Dresden, reaching its highest crest since 1845. These types of floods are in line with what climate scientists have been saying would be the result of climate change and a warmer world. New flood management strategies are being called for, as old plans are simply inadequate. One recent flood event in Austria killed seven people, forcing civil authorities to extend flood mitigation planning to areas that had previously never needed it. In 2002, Russia recovered 49 bodies from the Black Sea after flooding, with many more never being found. Some voices disagree with the climate change scenario, saying that weather records are relatively new, so it's too soon to really know if weather extremes can be linked to human activity. In Mozambique, the worst flood in 50 years hit after three days of torrential rain swept across southern Africa, forcing 77,000 people from their homes. But it was just the beginning. After two more weeks of rain, tropical cyclone Eileen hit coastal regions and rains continued for five weeks. More than 45,000 people were rescued from trees or rooftops by helicopters from Mozambique, South Africa and Malawi. Waterborne diseases broke out and with the loss of 42 clinics, including the country's second largest hospital at Beira, the death toll mounted. 1,400 square kilometres of agricultural and grazing land was taken out of production and it took Mozambique years to recover. Without access to radio or television, many were caught unawares by the rapidly rising waters of the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers, with hundreds washed away in the strong currents. Last year, across India and Bangladesh, millions were affected by severe monsoons. In the north of Bangladesh, 500,000 people were marooned as the Brahmaputra and Padma rivers broke their banks. Across the Indian states of Assam, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, infrastructure was smashed and 20 million people were directly affected by the flood waters. Drinking water sources in these areas were either contaminated or submerged and disease rates began to surge. Aid organisations rushed to supply equipment for boiling drinking water. Because flooding is happening more and more frequently in these areas, governments and aid agencies are changing their approach to floods, giving people knowledge about water purification and the means to adapt houses. Communities get long-term support so they can quickly recover after floods. Here in Damnagar village, the men have begun building flood defences to help deflect the waters that come with the next monsoon. The Indian government estimated that infrastructure damage ran to half a billion dollars, and this figure does not include the huge losses in agricultural production. There are other hidden costs, with buildings that survive the floods being weakened and roads that remain passable but are seriously undermined. Damage to irrigation systems is difficult to calculate. The full picture is often not known till well after the waters recede. 
In the state of Orissa, while much of the country was still underwater, cholera broke out. Aid organizations moved to set up mobile health camps, not only treating sufferers, but trying to raise awareness about the importance of clean drinking water. Though there are very simple oral rehydration techniques for treating cholera, if sufferers do not get the right treatment, they can quickly die. Before long, 150 people, mostly infants and the aged, had died. The figure climbed to 500 before the outbreak was brought under control. The state of Orissa has a very large population. Though this outbreak was contained at numbers that were relatively low, authorities want to establish a broader understanding about the causes and treatment of waterborne diseases, like cholera, that always accompany flooding. While waters were still high, volunteers began searching canals and rivers, looking for human casualties and for the bodies of animals, potential sources of contamination. Mobile clinics did the rounds of the flood-devastated areas in an attempt to prevent outbreaks of waterborne disease. But scarce resources spread across a large population make it difficult for doctors to have much of an impact. It is the same with food distribution, and developing countries hit by flood often rely on international aid to supply areas temporarily without means of food production. Large floods requiring large amounts of food aid can also affect prices of staples far beyond the inundated regions. It is ironic that areas affected by flood always face a crisis in the supply of clean water, with sterilization chemistry one of the first items dispatched when floods strike. Typically, it is very poor, very populous regions that are suffering the most through more frequent flooding. Climate change issues are firmly on the agenda of almost all developed countries, but now international aid groups are calling for rich countries to help poorer nations struggling to come to terms with changing weather patterns. Experts say there's no doubt that although climate change will affect us all, the poor will bear the heaviest burden. New British research shows climate change over the next 200 years will increase the risk of forest fires, droughts and flooding. The Quest team at Bristol University believe the findings should alert policymakers to take greater steps to reduce global warming. An increase in average global temperatures of 3 degrees Celsius will start a runaway effect, with terrestrial biomass releasing added CO2, exacerbating the warming effect. The risk of severe events such as drought, fire and flood is increasing. Extra rain in some areas means severe drought in others, and the effect on food production will lead to famine and huge movements in populations. Fire will also amplify the greenhouse effect as it releases huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. Quick action to cut CO2 emissions now could stabilise the global temperature increase before dangerous secondary effects kick in. In August 2002, Central Europe experienced more than a week of heavy rains that triggered floods of unprecedented severity. Dozens lost their lives and thousands were left homeless. The weather pattern was part of a larger system that also affected Asia. Prague, one of Europe's cultural centres, was severely affected and the call went out for art restoration experts, as well as more conventional aid workers, to help repair the damage to priceless treasures. When the waters receded, ancient buildings were left choked with mud and debris, with some estimates putting the damage bill in the billions of euros. Just three years later, people in the same parts of Europe were preparing for more floods, though this time it would be Romania, not the Czech Republic, that would take the severest damage. Since 1998, floods in Europe have caused around 700 deaths, the displacement of about half a million people and at least 25 billion euros in losses. London is particularly vulnerable and a flood surge protection barrier has been built across the River Thames. 
Weather experts have carried out a large experiment to examine possible conditions which might trigger a massive flood of the Thames. The findings raised important questions about London's ability to cope with a major flood. Met Office records of actual storms were manipulated to produce an extreme low pressure event, resulting in winds that came down the North Sea and created the ideal conditions for a tidal surge in the River Thames. The serious event for London will be a maritime event, resulting in a tidal surge, which is why London has a barrier. The barrier is designed to protect London against all but the one in 1,000 year event, which is reckoned to be a high level of protection. However, there is a large amount of guesswork in this calculation, especially with the broad range of predicted effects assumed to flow from climate change. The effect of the computer-generated storm was observed when the city's defences were breached to test the mathematical models. Future studies will focus on velocity of floods as well as depth, and a second workshop will focus on the River Severn on the east coast, with a third simulation looking at urban flooding in Glasgow in Scotland. The meteorologists saw extensive flooding across London, but only after every defence had been pushed to extremes that have not yet been recorded, giving them confidence that the English capital was well protected against flood. The Netherlands is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. And with half of the country below sea level and constantly under threat from rising waters, building space is scarce. One solution is to build floating homes. In 1995, when the River Mass flooded in the south of Holland, hundreds of thousands of people were forced to leave their homes. Dutch construction company Dura Vermeer has built 37 floating houses just outside the village of Maasbommel, an area prone to flooding. Before being positioned on the water, the houses are constructed on land and then placed atop concrete pontoons filled with giant lumps of polystyrene reinforced with steel. They are said to be unsinkable. And it's a concept that developers are planning to take even further. Floating hotels, floating roads and floating runways for aircraft are all on the drawing board in the Netherlands, which is particularly vulnerable to sea level rises due to climate change. The nation has always had a close relationship with water. In many Dutch cities, canals replace streets and flood defences are a necessary part of the country's security. In February 1953, the Netherlands faced disaster when the dikes protecting the southwest of the country were breached by hurricane force winds and exceptionally high spring tides. To prevent a repeat of the disaster, the Dutch government launched the Delta Project to protect the southwest Netherlands from the North Sea. Four main dams were built, two with lock gates, along with several secondary dams located close to the estuary. All these dams reduced the length of the coast by 70 kilometres, creating soft water reserves and preventing floods. Phase two of the project is an ongoing process to systematically bring all dikes around the Netherlands up to the required standard and to maintain them at that level of strength before floods occur. Close monitoring of weather patterns plays an important part in the country's flood management, as do evacuation plans. The Dutch have been carefully watching the recent global rise in water levels and changes to weather patterns. They have done everything in their power to protect themselves against the risk of flooding. But are they able to evacuate more than four million people from flooded areas in a short period of time should disaster strike again?
virus is spread across 118 small islands in the marshy Venetian lagoon along the Adriatic coast of northeast Italy. The city-state was a major maritime power during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and an important centre of commerce and art for 500 years. During the 20th century, artesian wells were sunk around the lagoon to provide water for industry, but this caused subsidence and the city became vulnerable to flooding. The pumping of water has long been banned and the settling has stopped, but Venice now floods regularly. A plan to protect the historic city from extremes of flooding is just getting underway. Barriers across the three mouths of the lagoon will hold back the high tides. Venetians have endured tides and flooding since the city was founded, but it wasn't until 1966 when a super high tide flooded in and swamped the city, destroying the homes of some 5,000 people, that Venice's elders decided to take action. Some inhabitants are still skeptical. Only the first stone has so far been laid to begin the construction of underwater barriers. Known as Mose, the plan envisages the construction of 78 flood barriers, 20 metres wide and up to 28 metres high, that will be fixed to the bed of the sea. The barriers will normally lie on the bottom of the lagoon. The metal screens are filled with water, but when high tides require the isolation of the lagoon, air is pumped into the barrier, causing it to rise. The scheme is not expected to completely resolve all the problems of flooding in the lagoon city. The idea is to let normal fluctuations of around 60 centimetres in and out of the lagoon, thereby preserving its delicate ecosystem and allowing polluted water to be flushed out to sea. Despite the horrific memories of 1966, environmentalists have opposed the scheme, saying it puts the delicate ecosystem of the lagoon at risk and costs too much for a structure that does not protect against floods. But more than 40 years on, and after a series of proposals and counter-proposals, Mose is a step closer to coming to the city's rescue. The system is expected to be capable of holding back the floodwaters of the Adriatic by 2011. Venice was not the only city devastated by flood in 1966. That year also saw Florence's River Arno break its banks, devastating the city's cultural treasures. Even today, the city has not completely recovered from the 1966 floods there were virtually no emergency measures in place. Estimates say 600,000 tonnes of mud, rubble and sewage severely damaged or destroyed numerous collections of the written work and fine art for which Florence is famous. Between three and four million books and manuscripts were damaged, as well as 14,000 movable works of art. A group that became known as the Mud Angels retrieved damaged fine artworks. Restorers are still busy repairing damage from the flood. Artwork by Renaissance greats were hidden for years in warehouses awaiting attention in the city's prestigious Opificio Restoration Laboratories. The never-ending repair work that happens in the laboratories has made Florence one of the world's centres of art restoration. Restoration starts with a thorough health check, using chemical analysis, x-rays and even CAT scans to gauge the makeup of each picture and the possible effects of different cleaning methods. X-rays can also reveal some of the secrets of a piece's original construction. Giorgio Vasaris's depiction of The Last Supper is currently being assessed. Restorers are not sure whether anything can be done to save the stunning oil painting. The work, finished in 1546, has remained coated with alluvial sludge since the flood. The paint has blistered, its gesso undercoating has disintegrated, and the wood panel backing has warped. It could take years just to make the decision whether anything can be done to save it. 
The Uffizi Gallery and the Santa Croce Church and Museum were among the hardest hit by the flood as they sit near the banks of the River Arno. Often rice paper is used to cover the affected paintings to slowly draw out contaminants. Pictures are stored in cool, stable environments where humidity is slowly decreased. In extreme cases, with wood panel pictures, the paint layer is extracted from the wood and gesso and then reapplied to a new support. Damaged canvases are relined and gauze applied to the painted surface, which is then ironed. This process is referred to as the rintillatura, or new canvas method. Relatively minor surface work is often completed with a variety of solvents or types of resin. Nystatin, an antibiotic, is sprayed on the wood in order to prevent mould from growing. Over the years, the restoration laboratory has continued to restore the damage incurred during the 1966 floods. But some art critics argue restoration is wrong and that the damaged art should be left to decay naturally with time. When heavy rains hit Argentina's Mar del Plata, floodwaters started to rise. Residents had seen this type of scenario unfold before, so they quickly dug trenches to divert fast-flowing waters away from their houses. The torrent flowed towards the Jose Maria Minella Stadium, which filled with water when pressure forced open one of the main entrance doors and flooded the pitch after rushing through the gym and the dressing rooms. After the waters outside had drained away, the arena stayed full, with water so high the goalposts were just visible above the surface. The generator room and service areas were completely underwater. Drainage is usually an important aspect of stadium design, so that the playing surface can quickly recover after rain, but something about the Mar del Plata arena's layout was just not performing as it should. When the Jose Maria Minella Stadium flooded in 1992, it was out of action for several months, disrupting the summer football tournament. The stadium was built in preparation for the 1978 World Cup. It has capacity for more than 43,000 spectators, but because Mar del Plata does not have a first division team, the stadium does not see very big crowds. Perhaps they should adapt it for water polo.